Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today at an event hosted by the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. I'm Toby Dershowitz, Senior Vice President for Government Relations at FDD. As many of you tuning in may know, FDD is a research institute focused on national security and foreign policy. We're nonpartisan and accept no funds from foreign governments. We come to you today marking a tragic and somber milestone. It's now been 10 years since Syrian civilians rose up in peaceful protest against the Assad regime. Since then, Syrians have been subject to the most horrific and deadliest forms of torture and brutality. More than 500,000 people have been killed. Half the population has been internally displaced and millions more have fled the country to seek shelter. Chemical weapons against the Syrian population have reportedly been used more than 300 times since 2011. And in the coming days will mark four years since the chemical weapons attack in Khan Sheikhoun, a town in southern Idlib province, killed nearly 100 people and injured more than 200 innocent kids, women, and others. Now, most analysts agree that Assad would not have been able to carry out his 10 years of war without the backing of Russia and the Islamic Republic of Iran propping up his regime with funding, with military equipment, and with militias on the ground. Significantly, when the international community has sought to hold Syria accountable, the Russian Federation has shielded it from punitive measures. Our experts will discuss the use of chemical weapons in Syria over the last decade, and more importantly, what can be done today to prevent these types of attacks from taking place again. So I encourage you to read our experts' full bios online, but allow me to briefly introduce them. Anthony Ruggiero is a senior fellow at FDD who has served for more than 19 years on Capitol Hill and in both Democratic and Republican administrations. Most recently, he served as deputy assistant to the president for national security affairs and NSC senior director for counter proliferation and biodefense. Thanks for being with us today, Anthony. Andrea Stricker is a research fellow at FDD and an expert on nuclear weapons proliferation and illicit procurement networks. She has done groundbreaking research on the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. We look forward to discussing your research with us today, Andrea. And Joby Warwick is a distinguished Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and a longtime Washington Post national security reporter. He'll discuss his latest book, which I read just last weekend and which I highly recommend to you titled Red Line, the Unraveling of Syria and America's Race to Destroy the Most Dangerous Arsenal in the World. So many lessons really to be learned from it, Joby. Thank you very much for this important work and for joining us. And finally, our moderator today will be my friend and colleague, David Adesnik, FDD's Director of Research, whose own superb research, a senior fellow at FDD, focuses on Syria as well. Thank you very much, David, for leading this very important and timely discussion, not only about what has happened in Syria, but the role of the world community in addressing these mass atrocities. For more information on FDD's work, I encourage you to visit our website, fdd.org. We also encourage you to follow us on Twitter, at FDD. And with that, David, over to you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us at FDD. I'm here with Joby Warwick of the Washington Post and my colleagues, Anthony Ruggiero and uh, Andrea Stricker. Uh, I'm David Adesnik, Director of Research and Senior Fellow. And we're gonna be talking today about chemical weapons in Syria, uh, especially because uh, Joby has published a new book on the subject. I'm gonna hold up my copy right here. As you can see, although the text will be reversed online, it is Redline, The Unraveling of Syria and America's Race to Destroy the Most Dangerous Arsenal in the World, with the subtle notice above that Joby has won a Pulitzer Prize, uh, which shouldn't be forgotten. Um, so the place where I'd like to start is really with the very first pages of the book. When I cracked this book open, uh, within around three pages, I said to myself, I'm reading all the way because the, the initial account there of the CIA asset known as Amen, a, a Syrian chemical weapon scientist, is so compelling. It's the first time it's been reported. Uh, it really, in a lot of ways, changes our perception of everything, uh, you know, and how the U.S. was thinking about Syria and the threat of chemical weapons. So if you could, could you just open and sort of summarize the story of Amen 
uh, why he was so important and what eventually happened to him. Well, thank you, David, and, and thanks to FDD for doing this event. I'm really pleased to be with everyone today. Uh, and you're right, the story of Eamon uh, was a, a great hook for me. As soon as I learned the story, I just couldn't wait to dig out more. But basically, this brings us back to the murky origins of, of Syria's chemical weapons program more than 40 years ago, so way back uh, in, in ancient history in a way. But it sheds light on, on features of the program that become much more important later on. And you know, for my purposes, he happens to be a very intriguing character. He's a mole, and, and that's uh, why my book opens with him. But to, to tell readers briefly, so Eamon is a scientist. He's a key figure in serious uh, development of ner nerve agents, specifically sarin. Um, we just call him Eamon because I agreed not to reveal his last name. His family is out of Syria, and there's some security problems or, or, or concerns for them. But the important thing about Eamon is that besides being a gifted scientist, um, he has a history with the United States. He had gone to the U.S. to, to study as a, as a young man. Uh, he, be, he has a, an affinity for the U.S. He likes Americans. And because of this, he becomes uh, an attempting target for the CIA when they're looking for a recruit from some, for somebody to give them information. And sure enough, uh, you know, some um, overtures are made. Um, Eamon becomes a spy, essentially a mole inside the, the chemical weapons program of Syria. And for more than a decade, he, he, he turns out you know, incredibly uh, valuable information from inside this secret lab that helps us understand um, what, what uh, the, the Syrians are doing with their program. And it's important because he's not just giving facts and figures, but he actually gives us, in one case, a sample uh, wrapped up as a Christmas present, some actual sarin uh, that was from their production line, and just it just the value of that in terms of understanding what the Syrians were do were, were doing, and also getting a sense of the quality that was that was really important. Now, there's a whole fascinating story with Eamon, of what happens to him, and uh, let's uh, let's not give it away, but just 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 to say it becomes very bad for him. Uh, there's a bit of a shocker ending for him, uh, but it does. Uh, we do learn a couple of things from Eamon. One is that Syria has a large, very sophisticated chemical weapons program. It contains all the nerve agents that we worry about. It's almost entirely indigenous, meaning that if it goes away or if the production system goes away, they still know how to make this stuff, and it's designated or designed to be a a deterrent. It's a strategic weapon to be used against Israel in a future war. And, but the other thing that's important is that years later, this information becomes priceless for us as we begin to grapple with the fact that here is a country that's at, in a civil war and within the boundaries of this country is a dangerous weapon of mass destruction. And we understand really well how dangerous it is and the potential risks, not only to Syrians, but to the region and to people outside the region if some of that stuff ends up with a terrorist group and taken someplace else. Sure, if I, I could uh, do a quick follow-up, it would be, could you elaborate a little on, you know, what it was like in the first, say, two years before the, the major red line incident where the U.S. had a fair amount of intelligence from Amen, and it seems like we were tracking things so closely that we could know if Syrian rebels, including extremists, were approaching those facilities. Can you sort of describe the atmosphere in the White House as they are watching this risk that the arsenal mm -hmm could fall into the hands of people who would potentially use it on, uh, I guess, civilians in Europe or the US. We did watch it very closely. And we were goaded along, actually, on this by, by the neighbors in the region, by the Jordanians, the Israelis, the Turks, who were extremely concerned about the possibility of this stuff getting out because they're next door. And so all of us are watching this very carefully. In the beginning, there's a belief that Assad would fall. He would fall to a moderate rebel force, presumably. And then negotiation would, would take place and we'd get these weapons out fairly quickly. But as 2012 turns into 2013 and more dangerous groups become more prominent on the rebel side. You've got al-Nusra, which is an al-Qaeda organization. You get ISIS beginning to pop up in the east. So there's a concern that um, regardless of which way the war goes, some of these individuals could end up taking out some of this stuff. And that becomes an animating thing for the, for the administration. Um, they're worried about that scenario. And they're also worried about the possibility that, that Assad could give some of this stuff away to his good friends next door to Lebanon, to Hezbollah. And some intelligence starts to come out in 2012 that Assad is trying to do just that. And, and that's part of the reason that Obama became so concerned over that summer about the movement of chemical weapons, which he keeps talking about uh, in, in press conferences and in, 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 um, in, his, in his talks saying that, you know, warning Assad, don't move the stuff, don't transfer the stuff. If you do, it's gonna be a problem for us. It's gonna be crossing a red line to use a famous, famous phrase.
Yeah, I think that's very interesting because it, it really helps make clear that Obama's red line was not um, sort of an off the cuff thing. The initial phrase may have been, but it really establishes the US had very clear intelligence about the extent of that chemical arsenal, even its precise locations. And there really was you know, a considerable threat focused on whether they could be lost or of course used by Assad, which is what happened. Um, there is lesser sarin attacks and then the major attack in August, 2013. And um, I sh should tell people who are considering reading one of the best things about the book is you keep having these compelling characters and you have this on the ground reporting uh, or it's sort of from their perspective, really giving a feel of what it's like to be an arms inspector on the ground. Uh, now on this, I wanna shift over to Andrea for some background because the organization that becomes really integral along with the United Nations is the OPCW or the Organization for, for the Protection of Chemical Weapons. Um, it actually goes on to win a Nobel Peace Prize for its role. And it even, it happens to be on the ground or with a UN team uh, when the attack on East Ghouta happens, killing around 1400 people in a single day. Uh, in August 2013. So Andrea, can you tell us what is this organization that so few people were aware of in August 2013? What exactly are its authorities and wh what are its goals? Yeah, so the OPCW is a body located in The Hague, um, Netherlands. It oversees the implementation of the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention or CWC. The CWC seeks the worldwide elimination of chemical weapons under international verification. It establishes monitoring and control over toxic chemicals, precursors, and production facilities. And under the convention, states commit never to develop, produce, acquire, or retain chemical weapons, to destroy those that they possess upon entry into the convention, to declare their stocks annually, and to submit to regular OPCW monitoring of their declarations. Uh, the group has three main bodies. It has a technical secretariat, it handles activities like inspections and is led by a director general. And it has a body made up of all 193 member states called the Conference of States Parties or CSP. That's the principal and plenary body. The Executive Council or EC is a 41 member elected body of member states, which is like a policy making body. It advises the CSP and both bodies seek to pass decisions by consensus mostly. Uh, but if necessary, they hold open ballot formal votes if necessary, and they need a two-thirds majority to pass a decision. Sure. If you could expand on one thing there, one thing you and I have talked about some in our work, um, is what are the, the limits on their powers? And if I understand correctly, and you could expand on this, this uh, uh, the OPCW is generally, with all the member states or state parties to the CWC, limited to inspecting what has been declared. They, Unlike, say, the IAEA, the nuclear inspectors, uh, they don't really have any authority to go outside and sort of hunt for anything suspicious. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So enforcement of the CWC is a major problem, sort of a tale of politics and sort of the nature of international institutions. So the CWC doesn't empower the OPCW to investigate, like what you said, undeclared capabilities on its own authority. So it has to be directed by member state bodies to carry out non-routine inspections um, so there are a few things that member states can do. They can request or vote for OPCW investigations and fact-finding missions if they have compliance concerns. Of course, a state can always refuse to cooperate. They can refuse access. Um, uh, states can also request the OPCW's technical assistance to help establish uh, facts of chemical weapons use on their territories. Um, and then another mechanism they have is called a challenge inspection. And that permits a state party to request an inspection actually of another state party's facility if undeclared chemical weapons efforts are suspected. And while it seems like that would be a no brainer to have a state call for a challenge inspection, for example, in Russia regarding its apparently ongoing Novichok nerve agent program, or to use this authority in Syria, it's actually never been done. Um, states fear that invoking the challenge inspection could lead to retaliatory uh, requests from the other state and then diminish the OPCW's strength overall. And then another worry is that the inspection may not succeed in detecting violations. For example, if a state hid something prior and for states like Syria and Russia, which we know use extensive disinformation campaigns about their chemical weapons use, we would expect that they would falsely claim they're exonerated, nothing was found, and then they would use that 
as further ammunition to disrupt and delegitimize the OPCW, which they have been doing over the past few years. Yeah. And um, yeah. No, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, and, and just finally, if if uh, non-compliance matters did escalate, the CWC does empower the CSP to bring issues to the attention of the UN, where the UNSC could act, but then they would be subject to the veto of Russia and possibly China. Yeah, and of course, for our audience, UNSC is the UN Security Council, where uh, Russia, China have vetoes. And a lot of, we find with a lot of these international organizations, if the, the final stop on the train is the UNSC, enforcement becomes very difficult. Um, so now I actually like to turn to Anthony, who, in addition to uh, his wealth of uh, sort of substantive knowledge, is of course occupied a key position uh, at the National Security Council staff. That in 2019, you became the senior director for WMD. Of course, at that time, we've already had two rounds of airstrikes where the Trump administration uh, re sort of in enforced the red line, uh, you know, basically launched missiles in the second case with uh, multilateral participation from the French and British. So, you know, can you give us a scene setter? What was the situation when you come in in 2019? We know Assad still has a portion of his arsenal. Um, I guess you may know more than it was publicly known at the time, but how are you thinking about it at that point? Is there a plan to try to deal with those chemical weapons? Is it a matter of reinforcing deterrence and making him know that there is a red line that's being enforced? Right, for me, when I when I started in July 2019 as an SC senior director, I, I looked at these issues through the prism of how can we get back to the internet, what was really an international norm of zero chemical weapons use. And so when it comes to Syria, you have the Syrians, uh, you know, unfortunately in the, in the past using chemical weapons. And then also Russia, I think as Andrea mentioned, Russia using uh, Novichok uh, now a second time against Navalny. So from our perspective, from my perspective, when I was on the NSC, is making sure there were consequences for those actions. You noted military strikes. There's other, uh, other tools that we have available high level diplomatic tools. And we had the Secretary of State, Secretary Pompeo, talking about uh, Syria's use of chemical weapons in September two, uh, 2019. Also using the OPCW uh, in July of 2020 to adopt a decision to, again, to your point, say that Syria needs to declare where, where all these weapons are because they continue uh, past their previous declaration to use them, and then also to destroy them. And, and I think the OPCW has said that they, they have not done that. And so, you know, the question for me, fast forwarding to, that, to today, is, you know, how can we ensure that there's enough consequences against those who use chemical weapons to send a message to others that might be contemplating using them uh, in, in the future. And I think it's still an open question. It's a, it's, a, it's a legitimate question for the Biden administration. They obviously instituted the sanctions against Navalny, but you know, the question is, is if there was another chemical weapons use in Syria, would they be willing to use military strikes? Um, is that, I mean, what you would advise as compared to other tools if Assad really wants to see if uh, getting he can get away once again with using sarin now that there's been a change of administration? And in that event, what was, what was the lesson in a way of the first two rounds of strike? Clearly the first one didn't deter Assad, but now we've had around three years where after the, the, the joint strikes with France and the UK, you know, we see there's a pause. Is that an indication that deterrence succeeded or are we conflating it with other factors? Well, I mean, deterrence with regard to Syria may have succeeded, but the Russians used chemical weapons, you know, six months ago. So, you know, when we're talking about, I know this is a Syria event, but when we think about global chemical weapons use, the, the broader question in my mind also is, you know, we have military strikes that may have deterred Assad, but then where there, there needs to be another layer on top of that to deter even chemical weapons use against dissidents. And to my mind, it's it's the fault of both the Trump administration and the Biden administration, frankly, that combined they waited six months before really uh, enacting sanctions against Russia. And then the just concluded OPCW meeting did not have any real decision on Russia. And so what kind of message does that send uh, on the consequences of chemical weapons use? To your point on military strikes, if, Biden, if, if you have a very similar situation, now that situation may have been unique where you have 
a use of chemical weapons and you have information that you have a high confidence or, or at least uh, enough confidence to do a military strike, I think the Russians and the, and the Syrians have been successful in ensuring that there's a large gap between when a strike occurs and when you might have impartial information or enough information where you'd be able to do something like a military strike. And that's going to be the challenge for Biden is, is there going to be enough information there for him to act and justify a military strike? And then if he doesn't do a strike, that sends a, a message that maybe the you know, that, that there is uh, lower consequences during the Biden administration. Yeah, that reminds me of something interesting uh, from the book. It's um, in the chapter discussing sort of, you know, the deliberations within the Obama administration. And initially, there seems to have been a very strong uh, reaction, especially among cabinet members saying, we have to enforce the norm of zero use of chemical weapons. And I thought that's interesting because it's saying we're going to try to enforce something that's relatively intangible. You know, you can't, uh, I mean, it, it exists in the form of a treaty, but you can't exactly point to a, a norm. And you're, are you going to risk war for that? And, uh, and yet what we see is as the norm eroded and Assad escapes punishment, Russia itself later begins to use it. And I think that's one of the interesting consequences that we're still seeing from something that happened um, in this controversial incident. So Joby, I was wondering if you could sort of take us back now to, to 2013 and really the sequence of events following, you know, the strike in Ghouta where it becomes fairly quickly that the regime has used these weapons and Obama has to figure out what he's going to do. Is he going to retaliate? Is he going to ultimately pursue, you know, the agreement that he's surprised later when the Russians come around to it? Um, you know, because I think in a way there's been a lot of mythologizing on this or, you know, speculation. That, is this the moment when Obama should have held his ground re regardless of what the public thought or, or is the mistake that he even drew a red line in the first place? So can you just tell us how that debate played out within the administration? Well, you're right about the mythologizing and I, I'm not... It's complicated. I think that anyone in the administration who was a participant at the time wish they could do a do-over. So many things kind of played out in ways they didn't expect, and and they ended up in a very very um, awkward position, to say the least, in the sense that they had sort of made this threat. We have this red line that uh, that can't be crossed, and yet they they emerge as almost powerless in in early September of 2013, kind of out of options, and and just are almost saved by this Russian offer to to do something different, which was to try this disarmament thing. But to bring people back, um, what I was able to 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 discover in recreating the moments and talking to people inside the White House at the time was that there was this almost unanimous view that we have to strike after this terrible the chemical attack in 2013. There was the red line uh, threat itself, which was, you know, essentially America's credibility on the line. But there was also this this taboo. This was important to enforce the uh, this century old taboo against the use of chemical weapons. And there was also human, uh, you know, a human atrocity, a mass slaughter of, of human beings. And you have people like Samantha Power in the White House who were, you know, her, her whole thesis uh, coming into uh, prominence as a public figure was on the need to stand up to acts of genocide. So all those things are weighing uh, toward or pushing toward a strike. And so, you know, the, 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 the you know, the, the machine goes into motion, the, the, the missiles go into launch tubes, their ships are in place. And yet Obama ends up being slowed down by a number of factors. One thing we have to remember that's a bit different about the later strikes is there was a chemical weapons, a large chemical weapons arsenal on the ground. And so that becomes a factor. There's a, there's a concern about, well, if we have a strike, what if Assad uses chemical weapons a second time? Or what if he then uses that as an excuse to, to give things away? We can't strike the weapons themselves. It's too dangerous because if you hit a stockpile of sarin, you might end up spreading it. So that's off the table. The one thing that that uh, that slowed them down initially was 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 a bit of a, a an oddity. There happened to be a UN inspection team on the ground in Damascus at the time of the, of the attack, which was just bizarre timing for all kinds of reasons, but it meant you had independent fact finders there at the scene to gather evidence. And as far as Obama was concerned, he knew what had happened. He knew there'd been a sarin attack. He wanted the, the UN inspectors to come out. And the UN essentially said, no, we've got a, a mission to do. It's more important now than ever that we try to gather the facts. And so there's this waiting period while, while the inspectors finish their work and are, are slowly, slowly brought out of, out of Syria. There's an intelligence issue, which you alluded to earlier. If, if you're going to have a military action in the Middle East based on a WMD um, you know, threat, 
you have to make sure your intelligence is absolutely ironclad and you have to be able to present it to the public. So that's that's taking some time. And as all these things are happening, the coalition falls apart. We have a, a, what was planned to be a US, British, um, French strike. The Brits go to parliament to get permission to do this and parliament votes it down. So suddenly you have two countries instead of three. You've got Germany and other countries urging Obama to slow down and wait, let's do this collectively. And so Obama does what many people consider just to be an out, kind of a cop out, which is to go to Congress to try to get congressional consent for this action. As it was viewed at the time, there was a sense that, you know, Obama as a candidate was always saying, you know, it's not appropriate for a president to, to, to carry out acts of war without congressional consent. So let's ask Congress, let's get Congress to come behind us and, and, and do this with us. And the belief in the cabinet was that Congress would say, yeah, Democrats would line up behind Obama. Republicans would, would want to rally behind the president in this case because of what had happened in Syria. And so they, they go to Congress and say, let's, let's get this bill approved. And the opposition in Congress was so strong, they decided to drop the whole thing. Nobody supported it. Public opinion polls were overwhelmingly against any kind of military involvement. Uh, in, in Syria. And so you end up in the situation early September 2013, where there are no options left. And, and uh, as Samantha Power says, and, and I quote her in the book, we were naked, we were out of options until suddenly this Russia thing came along. And, and we had this face saving way of getting out of what was really a difficult political and diplomatic jam. Yeah, the degree of improvisation was something that really struck me that, I mean, in a way, part of the the, you know, people who want to cast it as a particular turning point in history, whether for or against intervention, it sort of want to make it out to be very deliberate and well thought through rather than something that just sort of step by step came, came together um, in the way you show. I was wondering if you want to elaborate a little, something that came up a little earlier in the discussion was uh, misinformation or disinformation. And uh, despite, uh, you know, sort of pushing Syria into this deal, as I understand from the book, basically Russia, neither Russia nor Syria ever admits that chemical weapons uh, or that they used chemical weapons. And, you know, to this day, they continue to, you know, basically send deniers to the UN. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what's your sense of was it a sophisticated misinformation campaign or just flat out denial? Uh, did people buy it? Did it ever wind up puncturing uh, mm -hmm. the consent? So it is, it's an interesting case study in how disinformation campaigns work these days, because some of it is absolute, you know, absurd denial. And you see to this day, you know, Syrian spokesman, the foreign minister, UN, uh, you know, ambassador, you know, will say straight up that we never use chemical weapons ever, that not a single person was killed by this government in a chemical weapons attack. And all these things that you see, they're all false flags. They're all, you know, done by rebels or other forces. And it's absurd on the face because by now there have been so many investigations in, in our own intelligence gathering process. It, it's very clear what happened in those incidents. And yet the denials continue and they're amplified. And that's the new part by what is a really, to me, a very sophisticated echo chamber. And it's the bots. It's those the, um, so unusual allies, including academics here and there, former officials who for some reason believe that Assad is innocent of all this. And so they're trotted up, they write their papers, they question little bits of evidence here and there, try to take apart particularly the, the 2018 attack that, uh, that prompted the second US military strike in, in a town called Duma outside Damascus. And, and picking at, at a couple of, of conclusions that uh, weapons inspectors made and essentially suggesting that the whole uh, investigation was was tainted somehow and that none of it could be trusted and 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 just really you know chipping away at the credibility of international institutions like the OCW and there's an audience for that it's not just Syrians it's not just Russians but it's people who just want to be skeptical in general about about government processes and 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 you see and I see it all the time now myself a very loud very um, boisterous chorus of people who just want to say you know, none of this is real. You know, you can't believe anything the, U the UN says about what's happening in Syria and, and people buy it. And it's extraordinary, but it really is part of the world we live in now. Uh, just quickly, do you think there's something the UN or the OPCW could do better to resist that? I mean, you know, sometimes the advice is just tell the truth, tell it simply, and the truth will out. Uh, at other times, though, you know, as the saying goes back quite a ways, right? The, uh, while well, the truth's still putting on its boots, the lie is halfway around the world. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think there's been any missteps in the case of this with OPCW, or is it really a case where it's just hard to get ahead of a very determined propaganda campaign? 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, and there are a couple of things going on. One is I think that some of these, these big international organizations are hamstrung by their own, own regulations and restrictions. For the longest time, OPCW was, was in a position in Syria where it could gather information. It could say, for example, that sarin was used in this particular attack, you know, dropped by a helicopter or whatever, but they couldn't identify a culprit. They couldn't say that helicopter with Syrian markings was, was responsible for this, you know, for killing people with sarin. That was not in their rules to be able to say. Also, there's, there's a, sort of an institutional tendency toward hoarding information, frankly, at some of these institutions where they have great stuff. They have, you know, sometimes damning information, but they're so careful about how they present it because of, of international you know, diplomatic debates that arise, um, you know, uh, and, and also the final thing is just, just the, the ability of single members or in some, some cases, single members plus their allies of essentially shutting down debate within these organizations like the OPCW, where you can't get a consensus, where sometimes you get such a large group of, of dissenters, and Andrew has written about this quite a lot, where you really can't, um, you can't present facts. Uh, it's just it just the system does not allow the kind of, you know, here's the here's what really happened and, and here's why we think it happened. It gets much more complicated and belabored than that. Sure. Uh, good to mention Andrea's research. I think it's a good point to, to bring her in. So I guess Andrea, what I would ask is so there's been these efforts to push for accountability, I guess, going on eight years now in the OPCW. Can you bring us up to speed on the most current efforts, including the French led initiative that has been recently introduced? And uh, also talk a little bit just about the coalitions and like what Russia is trying to do to sort of gum up the works so that these kind of accountability measures can't pass. Right. Um, yeah. So Joby mentioned a lot. A lot of investigations have happened since 2013. Obviously, Syria has continued to use chemical weapons. Uh, so most recently in 2018, the Conference of States Parties (CSP) voted to establish its own unit um, devoted to determining the perpetrators of chemical weapons use called the, Identi the Investigation and, and Identification Team or IIT. Of course, Russia, Syria, they don't like these sort of assigning blame type bodies. They think it's outside the OPCW's mandate. Um, in April, 2020, the IIT released its first report assigning blame to several Syrian Air Force officers. That didn't go over well. Uh, as recently as July 2020, the EC voted to give Syria three months to demonstrate compliance with the CWC, and it still hasn't done so. Um, so really, I think states are at the feeling like they're at the end of their rope on what to do about Syria as far as using the OPCW. Um, one, one thing they can do is if they choose to is that under the CWC, member states can vote to suspend Syria, uh, suspend its rights and responsibilities at the organization. And uh, there's some indication that that's what the US and its partners may be considering as they move into the CSP next winter. Um, between then, they have two more meetings of the executive council and the council is supposed to advise the CSP to take that kind of action. So uh, we know that the US and 45 other countries seem to be alluding to t coming tough action on Syria, but obviously in order to suspend them, they would have to get a two thirds vote. So that's about 128 member states in the CSP that probably will take quite a bit of effort, you know, high level US diplomacy to corral all those votes. Um, um, but yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna ask you to elaborate a little on the voting dynamics. I know you've been you know, compiling data that other people really haven't uh, combed through systematically. And if you just describe sort of the coalitions that, I mean, you talk about the two thirds threshold and it seems there are a good number of US and allied votes, um, but, but because it's still majority or super majority driven, it's not that easy to block the way that anyone can with a veto at the Security Council. I mean, so who is it that is sort of siding with Russia and who is it that may be on the fence? Yeah. So around 2017, Russia really started to work to undermine the OPCW by gathering a coalition of states to vote adversely to the U.S. and its partners' decisions, or simply to just abstain in key votes. That's something the U.S. government, you know, Anthony, was definitely active in and trying to get people to not abstain, to just take a stand and vote the way they should you know, against chemical weapons use. Uh, so, but last fall at FD, we decided to analyze some of the, the voting data just to establish any trends. Uh, 
we found that about 27 member states uh, that are typically seen as US adversaries or friends of those adversaries actively side with Russia in OPCW voting. Uh, we found about 35 member states frequently abstain. So that makes it harder to pass decisions just because they're sitting on the fence. Um, and as you said, Russia clearly hasn't been successful in obstructing the OPCW's work. So what, what ends up happening is they delay decisions, they try to block agendas from being passed, they try to block budgets, and just cause all, all kinds of procedural trouble as well. Uh, but you know, there's concern that over time, Moscow could grow its voting block and peel away the needed votes uh, to take any action where it needs to be taken. Yeah, so it seemed that some of those states are simply not going to come onto our side. That's sort of the core rogue state alliance, you might call it, whether it's Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, the number of sort of uh, Venezuela-oriented Latin American states, uh, the Central Asians. They're not uh, going to move. But I guess just could you say a bit more about who, who is it that might potentially come off the fence if the U.S. pushed? Yeah, um, let's see. So a lot of countries that that maintain positive relationships with the US. Um, those that we, maybe we have significant trade relationships, we give them economic assistance or military uh, help or security. Um, some of those are like Algeria, Argentina, Bangladesh, you know, Benin, Bhutan, just going in alphabetical order, Brazil, <laughs> India, um, Indonesia, Thailand, you know, there's sort of medium powers, but also some larger powers that you know, definitely should be susceptible to our pleas to vote the right way. Sure. Uh, if I could turn back to Anthony, I was wondering if you could sort of describe, you know, what it looks like from your position uh, when you're actually trying to build these coalitions. Um, I mean, how eager are the closest allies, I guess probably mostly in NATO, to actually press hard? It does seem like the French took something of a leadership role. And, you know, when you go to representatives of other countries that may be on the sidelines, I mean, what, what exactly are they saying is saying, we don't want to get involved, this is not our problem, or, you know, we don't want to put ourselves in a position where Russia may punish us in some way. Uh, what, what was your experience like there? Right. So it takes a full court effort, right? It, it, it requires working the phones at every single level. And, and so the question for me is really going to be is is uh, Secretary Blinken prepared to make phone calls because that's what it may take with some of these countries. Uh, will will National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan do the same? Uh, and now, of course, you know people below them will try and uh, get the votes before that, but it's going to require. I mean, some of the themes are you know some countries don't want to get into what they might see as a great power competition depending on your definition of that, but at least, you know, get in the middle of the U.S. and Russia. The other is, I think it's useful to remind some of these countries, some of what we're talking about here, the, the scale of the atrocities, the fact that we're all, we all agree on trying to get back to global zero, global zero use of, of chemical weapons. And, and when, you, when you ask a country that, it's hard to, 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 to sort of go back against that. But the point that, that you and Andrea have made as well, they always have this out, which is to abstain, which to them seems like, well, they're not voting no, and they're not voting yes to you know, upset the Russians, but they're in a lot of ways making it harder for the US and its allies to get the two thirds vote. The other thing I would raise too is, and I mentioned this earlier, is you know, we're talking about Syria, but you know, when we get to the chemical, the zero chemical weapons use, you know, we obviously treat some of these situations differently, but I think people also notice when the OPCW doesn't act with regard to Russia, it sort of bakes in a double standard when it comes to Russia being able to use, in, in this instance, being able to use chemical weapons uh, and deny that and basically say, you know, this isn't the purview of the OPCW. In fact, what I think the U.S. and its allies should have done is treated it like Syria in 2020 and enacted a decision and said, you clearly used chemical weapons uh, via impartial labs that discovered that and, and you should be for Russians should be forced to get rid of that. I think at some level we have to have a level playing field uh, when it comes to reacting to, to these uses. Uh, but as Andrea said, it starts now, and, and, and certainly my hope is that inside the administration, uh, 
the Biden administration, they're starting to come up with these lists. And, and in some cases, even when someone says yes, you may have to call them again and make sure they remain a yes. Mm. I mean, do you think even U.S. principal allies in Europe are willing to go as far as to, I guess, demand a challenge inspection, demand a full investigation, or because it's Russia and they're generally conflict averse, are they going to ultimately back down? I guess for me, that's 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 an endpoint decision, right? It doesn't have to start with a challenge inspection. It can be like what happened with Syria and the decision by the OPCW in July 2020, where it just simply says, you clearly used a chemical weapon, so you have not declared all of your chemical weapon stocks. So you need to declare those, you need to destroy those, and come clean on what happened. And then if they don't do that, as, as Andrea said, you give them a deadline. If they don't do that, then you put them in the situation with Syria and you force a vote to remove their voting rights. And, and frankly, a Russia, an OPCW without Russia having voting rights might not be a bad OPCW in my mind, but you know whether we get there. I think on challenge inspections, the challenge is, no, no pun intended, as Andrea said, is what happens if you do call for a challenge inspection and you don't find anything? I think the point that was made earlier is the weakness really is in the OPCW enforcement gaps where they're not able to, on their own, go to a country and have a technical visit. They have to get Russia to, to invite them and co to cooperate. And that makes it harder to investigate any of these. And the, the point I made earlier as well, and I think Joby was talking about it, which is really increasing the length between a suspected chemical weapons use and when an impartial, uh, what, what most of us see as an impartial investigator or investigation, the conclusion comes out. I mean, what we're talking about with Syria is something that happened, you know, three years prior, right? That that investigation concluded in 2020, talking about, uh, I believe, incidents in 2017. It makes it real, really hard. It, it, when you're looking at your list of options, it really cuts off some of the options when there's a three-year delay in the in the finality of an of a investigation. Sure. At, at this point, I'd like to pivot a little, uh, again, back in time and back to Joby. Um, I think one of the most interesting stories that kept me reading uh, while I had a red line in front of me was this question, which most people didn't think much to ask, which is, okay, so if you find out Syria has all these chemical weapons, and we're talking, I guess, more than 100 tons, and they even decide to get rid of them, what do you do with it? Uh, how do you get rid of that number? And maybe it would become relevant with Russia and Novichok again if they ever became cooperative. Um, you know, but what you obviously found was that, it, and it's quite fortunate that uh, so there was some contingency planning a little bit ahead of time in the U.S. government by a, a fairly remarkable group that came up with something called the Margarita Machine, which was uh, uh, reminiscent of the thing where you you know you pull the lever and get your uh, you know fix of alcohol and sugar. Um, but if you could talk a little more about what was the margarita machine and why was it essential to actually getting rid of serious chemical weapons? Yeah, I did. you wouldn't want to drink what came out of this particular machine, but it's, it was a very descriptive uh, term. Um, and so, yeah, this is one of the, the cool stories, I must say, in, in, in kind of weaving this yarn together. Um, and it does go back all the way to this scientist spy we had back in the 80s. We really understood what the threat was, not just what Syria possessed, but in what form. Sarin was in a binary form, so it was mostly in this product known as DF, it was liquid, and it combines with another product at the end to create sarin. And so, so the, the Americans understood if we get this stuff, if we can get it out of the country, you know, what's the process for getting rid of it? Uh, we have experience getting rid of chemical weapons. We had our own program. The Americans and, and Russians did as well. We spent more than two decades, billions and billions of dollars building incinerators, uh, going through all kinds of environmental regulations. We're still not finished with it completely in this country. So clearly something that it wasn't something that could happen in Syria. It could not um, yeah, you know, involve an incinerator because those are 
very, you know, those are very difficult to build and operate. So the, the Pentagon came up with this solution that that uh, involved these machines where you essentially inject the liquids into this mechanical process. They get uh, combined with water and under pressure and, and it's it's complicated, but you, you come up with a product that's still toxic, but it's it's irreversibly neutralized. It's not going to be sarin anymore. You can't make it into sarin anymore. And so this was this amazing thing that uh, kind of a, a small shop at the Pentagon did um, in 2013. They built it in a couple of months. They made a prototype. They tested it. It worked. They made seven of them and just put them in a warehouse thinking that maybe we'll use them someday, but probably not. And when, when the situation turned out uh, in Syria where they actually needed this technology, they were available. And then becomes you know, this this hunt around the world for a place to put the machines because no country was willing to take 1,300 tons of, of liquid chemical weapons. Uh, we kind of went around hat in hand to countries like Albania and to beg them, please let us set these machines up here. We'll give you, you know, this and that. We'll let you come into NATO. All kinds of bribery went on. No country would take them. And so the last resort was to put these machines on a on an old ready reserve boat from the Navy. Um, send it out the Mediterranean, pick up the chemicals, and essentially spin circles around the Mediterranean for 40 days and burn off one, one barrel after another until they were all gone. The lesson, I guess, of all this is that there, there does need to be uh, tools available to deal with chemical weapons when they're discovered. We have ability in the, this country to do it on a small scale. Thanks to this invention, we have uh, you know, a more ambitious system. But th there could well be other opportunities if North Korea has a, a, you know, a change in leadership or decides to give up its weapons programs. There could be a very large chemical weapons uh, program to deal with there. So it's good technology to have. And there isn't really a body in the world, not the OPCW, certainly, that's really set up to go to a country and do the kinds of um, destruction on the ground that you would need to have. And that's why countries like the United States with the resources we have are absolutely vital to, to that kind of process. And actually, if you could just follow up a little, one another interesting part is when we actually get the margarita machine on this ready reserve boat, um, things uh, are a little rocky. There are some surprises uh, near the end. I don't think you need to give away all the spoilers. Maybe you could just talk about a few of the challenges and why it actually becomes a very close run thing that they can complete the mission while they're doing these circles in the Mediterranean. You know, before they started, there were um, a bunch of inspectors of various kinds that went on the ship to, to see if, if this process would work. And a Navy team came in and looked at this equipment and looked at the ship and said, this is way too dangerous to do at sea. These machines were, were built to be used on land. If you put them on a, on a boat in the middle of the ocean, there's all these additional stresses. You're going to have a real catastrophe on your hands. So that advice was absorbed. But at this point, this is late 2013, there was no other option. So they went ahead with this, this thing anyway. And, and sure enough, there were problems. When they get out to see some of the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the whole process that was originally designed didn't quite work. So they had to re redo it. There was environmental protesters who, who boarded ships and came looking for them. And there was this whole other problem with stability that, that um, was quite extraordinary. On a cargo ship, normally, you don't have cargo moving around. You have you know, the fuel at the bottom that's ballast, and you have kind of carefully balanced loads of cargo on the decks. This was a ship where things were moving around constantly. Fuel's being burned off. So the ship is becoming more top heavy and millions of gallons, literally millions of gallons of waste chemicals are being moved up to various levels of the ship and cleaning up on the very top. And so you have computer programs on this ship that shows the, the boat becoming more and more, more closer and closer to being unstable. And by the time the mission was over, they were literally within a few days of losing stability which raised the possibility that, that a rave of the wave or just an accident could cause the ship to capsize. And you can only imagine what that would have looked like on, on CNN. And it was a, a close call, but they managed to get it done. They didn't spill anything. Uh, and and they, they managed to destroy all the chemical weapons that Syria had given up, which turned out to be most of its stock, but not everything. And it was a pretty extraordinary story. Yeah. Um, on the question of disposal, I was wondering, Anthony, did that come up much in your portfolio? Is it something that you know is under active consideration has there been any follow-on to the margarita machine or is the fact that right now no one looks especially likely to give up their chemical weapons mean that it, it, we can sort of defer planning or it can be it can stay back within the pentagon within ditra or one of the other organizations I, you know i think that's a question beyond just the chemical weapons issue and and certainly when you 
when you uh, have uh, when you believe you might get close to that kind of disarmament or um, threat reduction, uh, you, you think through what those plans look like. But certainly during my time, uh, we didn't get close to that. Uh, I think you know as you get closer and closer, if you start down the road of negotiation with some with with a country, whether it's Syria, you know, Joby mentioned North Korea, Iran could be another example. There could be others. Uh, then you start to think about these uh, solutions. And what struck me in the book was that it, it was kind of an innovative solution, uh, both using it on a vessel, but then also the machine itself, uh, or at least the way it was described. Uh, and so, you know, you have to, Certainly, we hope down the road that that we'd be able to come come up with the same situation. But yeah, you you always want to make sure you're planning. We used to say you want to plan for success, right? Sometimes, sometimes you pursue a policy and uh, and it might not go the direction you're looking for. But you also want to make sure that if you are successful, you're able to achieve what you're looking for. Sure, I'm going to direct the next question to Andrea. Although I'm not, it may be may be pieces of answer of the answer from each of you, which is. I mean, would it make any sense for the OPCW to develop the capability to dispose of chemical weapons? Or is it more, is that sort of outlandish and we really should have the nation who has them take charge? And if you change what the OPCW is doing, either in that regard or in giving it additional inspection authorities, does that mean you have to change uh, the underlying chemical weapons convention? Do you have to get all 193 parties to agree? And, and which seems like a pretty high bar. So I guess two questions. One is about the disposal, but more broadly, what does it take to change the chemical weapons and the nature or mission of the OPCW? Yeah, I think you would you would probably need the two thirds vote if I'm correct on that. Um, yeah, but they you know they don't dispose of the chemical weapons now, so that that would have to be added. I think, in short. Mm. And okay, so but it's two thirds and not necessarily all 193. So potentially new authorities or missions potentially don't need to just overcome effectively a Russian veto. I believe so. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I mean, Anthony, was there ever any consideration of that? I'm just uh, sort of uh, speculating here. But what would your recommendations be for the person sort of more broadly now sitting in your chair? At, at the NSC doing uh, WMD, what should their top priorities be when it comes to chemical weapons? Well, I think, you know, the OPCW is at a crossroads, right? I mean, the, this session really describes it. When you go to the OPCW website, right, they get what, what pops up is essentially making sure we have a world free of chemical weapons, right? Not just chemical weapons use, but of chemical weapons. And, and we have right now, these two uses, these two types of uses, right, by Syria uh, in their own country against, you know, uh, civilians, and then really the Russian using it for assassination purposes. If we get a year, two, three years down the road from now, uh, which is really well into the Biden administration, which is why this is, this hopefully is a very important issue uh, on their agenda, and there's no consequences for either of those. So we have a report that comes out on Syria in 2020, and we don't, in this scenario, don't get a removal of voting rights. And there's no real consequences for Russia using Navalny. What that shows to countries is maybe there's a benefit to having chemical weapons or to planning in, in, in that sort of way. And to me, that's a, that would be a disastrous result, which is why from a policy perspective, they really need to be doubling down to have consequences for serious use of chemical weapons and figure out a way to use the OPCW to challenge Russia's use. Now, to your question on, on using it for, for getting rid of chemical weapons, you can certainly think about doing that, but we're not really at a situation where a country has been willing to do that. And then I think the other point is that what we learned is that how do we look at the serious situation and not come back with the same result, which is an 80, 75% solution. You gotta to get to a 100% solution. And that to me is less about making sure you have a margarita machine and more about, you know, are you willing to press uh, the Syrians or whatever country it might be to getting to the 100% disarmament scenario. Mm. Well, time flies when we're talking about weapons of mass destruction. 
Uh, I regret that our time is just about up. So really what I just wanna do is thank our audience for joining us, thank our panelists for joining us and tell everyone that of course, there's a lot more to learn on this subject. To read more from Anthony and from Andrea, you should go to fdd.org where all of their publications will be. Uh, of course, for the story about the red line and the weapons, pick up a copy of Red Line by Joby. Uh, you won't regret it. As I said, it is really full and we didn't even touch on probably a half dozen figures in this book who each one of them is a formidable, challenging person who you'll get a view on the ground for whether it's a, you know, a Syrian general or an inspector or a diplomat. And, uh, you know, it reads almost like, you know, it's reads like uh, crime fiction or thrillers, uh, but it's actually based in facts and you can see it all in the footnotes. So thank you all for joining me and, uh, and to our audience as well. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great day.